All right, so uh, Sen suggested that he could apply the approach in a variety of circumstances. In particular, if I could have the clicker, I'd be in better shape myself. Um, I want to set with an option, which is to have this, there it is. Uh, but it was left unspecified as to how to implement any of this stuff. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, is it implementable? And when I reviewed uh, inequality reexamined, I think for Russell, I forget who I reviewed it for, but anyway, I reviewed it in, in, for the book, a book company. And one of the main critiques I had of the whole approach was, this can't be implemented. This is too complicated. There's too many moving parts here. No one will agree. Okay? And so I just want to have some examples brought out to in, inform me as to how this might actually occur. And they weren't brought out in that book, and maybe they weren't brought out thereafter either. So it was left to other people to implement this approach. All right? Do you have a feasible implementation is what I said in my report, uh, an example where the approach can be applied and it makes a difference. How do you measure capabilities, functioning, and freedom? So the challenge of measuring freedom. Freedom has two elements, agency and empowerment, broadly configured within uh, SEN's framework. Uh, and opportunity, which is the, that's the set we've been talking about. The agency is the ability to actually achieve these things, to make them happen. Opportunity is that range of opportunities. Both are difficult to infer from observed choices. Are you going to ask people, you know, what conditions were the choice that you made, you know, were the choices that you made made under? Did you experience duress? Was someone there telling you what to choose? That's the kind of question you almost have to ask if you want to know the agency of the person in choosing what they chose. Also, without asking them, how are you going to know what choices they didn't take? Well, maybe infer it, but in many cases, it's not much structure there. All right. So is there data? Are there data on, on agency? Yes, there are. I mean, of the type I was mentioning, that you ask people about the extent to which they could make choices. And there's uh, questionnaires uh, at OPHI, OPHI, in Oxford. Uh, you can go online and see some of these empowerment or agency questionnaires. And many of them have been actually uh, used in subsequent measures that are now being rolled out. One of them is the Women's Empowerment and in Agriculture Index. The idea there is USAID and Feed the Future, a big $3 billion, I, I don't know, it's a big program in, in the US, uh, had the idea that if you expanded the empowerment of women in the realm of agriculture, that productivity would increase. And so, if so, then we need to measure <coughs> empowerment. We need to measure this stuff. And how are you going to measure it? Well, they went to OFI, went to a number of us, and uh, <coughs> various techniques were put together and out popped this uh, Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index. It's actually two indices, one of which is a related to my FGT poverty index, poverty gap, and the other is related to the Alkair Foster poverty, uh, poverty uh, measure. So the two of them were used to construct this thing. So you can do something. You can do it. Right? There's questions on inclusion and decision making. But it's always hard to know whether you take it seriously. Actually, what they do is they ask women, ask women. Men, ask men. And so men are getting asked the same stuff. And it's possible then to compare empowerment within the household. It's, power, it's possible to compare whether the answers correspond to one another, <laughs> right? Because if the woman says, I'm not included, and the man says that I am included and my wife is included, there are some interesting discussions to be had, okay? But there are ways forward, and there's a large group of people who are moving this forward. But it's still a tough issue because of all the problems with subjective data. Uh, you had a question back, sorry, Max. Yes, it would be. And if I were a sociologist, I would. As disagency and disfreedom or unfreedom and unagency. Yeah. Yes. Is that just a rhetorical reference? Mm. Or does that lead to different measures or different conclusions? You know, I haven't thought. 
I really haven't thought of that because I, I do think, just on the spur of the moment, that one of them is a positive and the other is a negative approach to freedom. So that may be what's framing the whole issue. Um, I sometimes find the uh, approach of power to be problematic in certain ways of discussing things, but in the others, it's the only way to discuss it. Hell, I'm five blocks from K Street in Washington, D.C. Power. <laughs> That's where the power brokers are located. That's where the action is taking place, and I know it, and everyone knows it, and it is restricting my freedoms in so many ways, <laughs> but uh, not their freedoms. They're driving around in big cars and everything else. <laughs> but uh, so maybe it is a positive versus negative, and I don't know. So that's a, a valid question, and I haven't, I haven't explored that. Good question. Uh, so take a sociological approach versus uh, the kind of Senian. Okay. Data on opportunities. Do we know stuff about these capability sets? Well, recall the budget set. You know, if you have an income and a price vector, you're in pretty good shape to know, if you know what the space of commodities would be, what the set of feasible points would be, right? That's easy. You don't need much more than those two numbers. And of course, the setup of what the uh, overall space is. But not with capabilities, right? You can observe functioning, but where do you get the size and the shape of the capability set? The question which was asked here, is there a way that we could get it through direct questioning? Yes, they do some discussion through direct questioning, particularly if there's finite number of alternatives that they're being asked about, it's easy to say, well, was this something you could do? Was this something you could do, et cetera? Or inference, and that's, we're talking about some way of extracting from data what that surface must look like, and therefore the extending from perhaps a local to a global shape of the set. Uh, and, and what's interesting about that is that, you know, it's, you're not seeing those other alternatives. People don't show it to you, but you're trying to find out what they were, and so, for the purposes of, in this case, evaluation. A totally different evaluation than the usual approach, but you see it, it may be quite related. Finally, observations, I just say this in passing because I was thinking Ramadan and fasting and uh, you're looking at two people right now, okay, fasting, uh, or maybe starving. But then the month is over, preferences change, okay? I mean, not really preferences, but the sort of local preferences are changing. And you then start to see one person not be restrained so much in, in their eating, and the other person is still restrained in their eating. And so time, observations, may in fact reveal what's going on, particularly through changing preferences. I'm saying local preferences, if you will, right? Right now I'm under the strictures, I'm going to do this, and later it's going to change as I do something else. So you can get from a variety of of preferences, more information about the set. Okay, measuring opportunity freedom. There's a bunch of lines in thought and literature over uh, abstract sets, typically. Traditional indirect utility evaluation is also called an elementary evaluation. Uh, there's no value for unchosen options. That's the typical way of thinking it from an economics point of view. Potnack and Zhu, a long time back, thought, well, wait a minute, there's something to be said about having more options, and we should just inherently think that they're more valuable. And so in trying to get a notion of freedom, they just assumed it. And they wound up getting what's called a counting approach, that w every option is as good as the other, and they all contribute, and it goes up cardinally one for one as you have more options. It's axiomatically derived, but depends on the inability to discern the relative quality of options. That's my main critique of their approach. Obviously, if you had some notion on quality, why would you measure them all the same? It basically assumes that all options have the same value without doing any explanation at all as to why. So there's a literature in this, but it's not very well known. Sen had a, uh, several papers on it, uh, the Arrow Lectures and so on. Arrow wrote a paper on it. I had something a while back, and then finally came out in another location. Uh, the whole question is how to, give value to the unchosen options, to the ones that were not chosen. Where does the value come from? And the value in this approach comes from the notion of freedom as flexibility. Good choices available for any contingency. A kind of options value, and it derives from Krebs's original paper in Econometrica in 79. And in fact, Sen 
visited in Cornell in 84 when I was, uh, 80, yeah, 84 when I was uh, visiting there. And we talked over this particular paper and had forgotten completely about it until 20 years later that we had talked it over. This paper was really instrumental in thinking, f making it so that there's a, a real fundamental um, way of characterizing flexibility. And it turned out to coincide very closely with the way that I had done it and Arrow had done it. So how do you measure achieved functionings? So we've talked about capabilities. How do you measure achieved functions? Why is it important? Uh, don't they miss out on a lot of stuff? Yeah, they do. They miss out on the freedom aspect. But they still get at some other things, which is the actual conditions that people are experiencing right now. So functionings may actually have some ethical priority. You should have focused on people's functionings to an extent, because the capability is somewhat hypothetical, and it should be placed in relation to the achievement. Okay. In any case, using functionings is a useful first step. Data are there. One can at least get close to using functionings. Uh, Most of the examples of capability approach use functionings. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that sometime. Uh, there are a bunch of issues with using functionings. You can do it, but there are many dimensions, and you have to somehow find a way of combining dimensions. That's a problem that everyone who works in multidimensional data finds out is hard. <laughs> Two, three approaches of dealing with it is perhaps you'll let the data decide what might be important. That's one way, but Sen would argue that that's not the right way. They would say, he would say, if it's an evaluation process, you should use valuations that are reflective of normative values, not just that happen to be in the data set of the day. That would be his response. Uh, incompleteness, you wind up having a lot of situations where things are not in agreement, and so you may not be able to say anything. There's no evaluation. We can't give much intuition as to what way to go. Weights and measures, a very interesting topic. How do you deal with the fact that it may not be possible to pick a specific weighting structure for evaluating the different functions? And most people throw up their heads and go running, but Sen, because in his 1970 book, had a wonderful way of addressing this issue that we've just pulled into a paper and constructed a method of robustness for comparisons using many weights. So you have sets of weights, and the sets of weights get bigger and smaller. As it gets bigger, there's more incompleteness because with a different weight, the functioning aggregate disagrees with another ranking, right? So you have two situations. This one's better under one set of weights. This is better in the other. But sometimes, all weights would agree, or at least the ones that are reasonable, that this is a better situation and never agree that this is the better situation. So if that's the case, you can actually test through to see which it is going on. Maybe it's the unambiguous one. Maybe it's the one that's ambiguous. And perhaps even measure a degree of ambiguousness between a choice of this or a choice of this. And that's what we do in the paper. I won't be able to get to it today, but that's what it's. Uh, based on uh, uh, work by uh, Truman Bewley and people who work in ambiguity. Example, another example, and this is actually a composite indicator, just like we were talking about with weights that may change and therefore change rankings. The HDI, Human Development Index, a fabulous index that combines standard of living, education and health into one index to combat the gross uh, domestic product originally, now gross national income. To say that's not the only way of proceeding. You can actually go a step further in eva evaluating countries and how well off people in those countries might be. See? Um, so what they do is they transform these variables. They choose the three variables. Why? Well, they choose the three variables. You have data. They're variables that are at the country level, so average income, if you will a kind of indicator of health and education that is combined across the society. It's not a s distributional sensitive one in particular. And then what they do is, before combining, they transform the variables. In particular, the living standard is made concave, so it has less weight. You always wondered why Qatar wasn't the top country in the world. Uh, there it is. Okay. 
it's because of the concavity that's thrown into the income side. Otherwise, income rules the roost in the Human Development Index. Um, and then they're normalized. And normalized means that they're trying to make comparisons across variables that are absolutely non-comparable. They are cardinal, but what does that mean across dimensions? Nothing. So they try and find a goalpost at the lower level and a goalpost at the upper level. And those are the zeros and the ones and everything in between. Now, is it justifiable? No. Does it subject to, is it subject to sort of non-robustness? Of course. But the fact is, is that it has salience. It's a concept that people believe in, and even if the particular way that it's presented isn't entirely 100% kosher and can't be, they still do it. <laughs> and thank goodness, because the intention is, I think, right. Uh, then they go ahead and average these things, as I said. And the, as I said, the averaging could be dependent on different weights as opposed to equal weights. Uh, nowadays, they average in terms of a geometric mean. And indirectly, that was my fault, because I proposed the geometric mean for the so-called Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, which actually looked at the geometric mean in income, in a health indicator, personal health indicator, and personal education indicator, uh, and then aggregated across with a geometric mean. They took the geometric mean and applied it to the original index. Um, it's now under some question as to whether it's going to go back to the, to the average like it was before, so the arithmetic mean. Uh, there's many, 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 many criticisms on this issue because there's so many ways that arbitrariness is inter. There, this isn't really a capability anyway, the living standard. It's per capita GDP. So it isn't really a human development or capability approach. It's human development. It's not really hardcore ends, you know, as opposed to means approach. But it, it's approximating, and there are good discussions you can make as to why you would use living standard to ca capture all the things you can't capture any, any other way. But the assumptions are big. Criticisms have been very loud. And one of my co-authors on the previous paper on robustness was one of the largest critiques of the Human Development Index. So we're addressing some of these issues through, through positive work as opposed to just saying this can't be done. OK. Example two, the multidimensional poverty index. Uh, this has been adopted by the UNDP, it comes out every year in the same Human Development Report, and it's over a bunch of countries, maybe about 109 now. And all of them are meant to be, you know, the lower end of the spectrum because the upper end would have obviously very different sorts of setup for evaluating poverty. You wouldn't use the same thing for Europe as you would for, let's say, uh, most of the countries in Africa. One of the nice things about this, it avoids a lot of the critiques from the previous slide, which were in terms of variables and the transformations and what the heck does it all mean. We find a way of converting these sort of qualitative capability related variables into, well, you have a cutoff. Above, you're not considered deprived. Equal, you're not considered deprived. Below, you're considered deprived. It's crude, but that's the way we do poverty analysis anyway. And we do this in all dimensions. And it turns out it's the way we do everything in this setup is robust to how you rescale variables. Because variables that you have in this context are, you know, the real variable or the real data would be something like uh, the, the, the uh, quality of sanitation or what's, what form of toilet you have or your housing. Very qualitative discussion. And, but people can say very easily what constitutes satisfactory or acceptable and that which is unsatisfactory or a deprivation in the original conception of the data. But then it's transformed to numbers. And those numbers are meaningless. And you have to therefore adhere to the fact that the numbers are meaningless, otherwise your measurement and the results you get are depending on meaningless junk. Our approach has that property. The HDI doesn't have all of that. It's measuring, anyway, well-being of all people and averaging everyone, including the high guy with the low guy. MPI is looking down at the lower group. How do you measure opportunity freedom? Hmm. Why should we care about functionings that are not chosen? I want to start with a simple world and rush you through a result or two to give you some insight as to how we might imagine measuring freedom, even though the first two 
ways of imagining it are non-starters. The third way I would imagine, <laughs> I would think, has some possibilities. So let's go forward. So we're going to start with a case with discrete number of functionings, much like you might be able to get by asking people what they have available to them. Here's the notation. X is a finite set of functionings. It should be functionings. Uh, an opportunity set is a non-empty subset of X. It's a capability set equivalently. A, B denote those sorts of sets of options. And Z is the set of all opportunity sets. Z is the set of all opportunity sets. So the goal here is to find some way of ranking these opportunity sets or measuring freedom with respect to the options inside. So that's what's going on here, right? We might have individual preferences. We might not. I'm doing it at an individual level right now. This is for a person. So it's very modest and very tentative. A, R, B means that A has at least as much freedom as B. I am not requiring R to be complete, OK? Because I'm going to allow the possibility we can't make a decision on that. Yes? So you're thinking of this kind of choice Yes, I am. There's also a Fair enough. And I'm ignoring that right now. I'm ignoring, no, I'm ignoring that. In fact, I'm going to ignore it the whole discussion just to get across a simple point or two. Uh, there are ways of considering, for instance, uh, the probability you might have a fuzzy uh, structure so that you have elements which could be in the set or could not be. And here is my numerical representation of that between 0 and 1. Extends directly. In fact, it in, in the, the book this is from, this is on the Handbook of Social Choice and Welfare a few years ago, uh, the article on opportunity and freedom and well-being. OK, uh, let's go on. So what assumptions should we have on R? I assume that it's not necessarily complete. Could be. It's a quasi-ordering. Quasi-ordering is reflexive and transitive, but that's it. Completeness, not assumed. They are transitive. In fact, each part of the ranking is transitive, the strict and the indifferent. Candidate one, how do you like this one? Let's just count them. Okay, and this is, yeah, it's an approach, right? Uh, define RC by ARC if and only if. And I'm using these bars to mean cardinality. I'll use a, a hash sometimes for that. So if you got more options, yeah, got higher freedom, or at least as high. Measures using the number of functions, functionings and is characterized by Potnik and Zoo. They spent the entire paper talking about this and showing the kinds of things that were needed to, to get this uniquely as the way of evaluating freedom. So I'm going to work you through this. It's very imme immediate, the kinds of results that you get. So let me work it through. The question mark there is a very interesting statement. That would be uh, intersection is this question mark. And this one I'll leave you to think about. And this is intersection. I'm guessing you know what this is. It's probably the empty set in MAC terms. Obviously, the MAC terms don't translate to the uh, PC terms. So sorry about that. We'll have a number of those during the course of this. So this says they're mutually uh, you know, distinct. They're not, they have no elements in common. All right, cardinal ranking is characterized by three axioms. You get it immediately. First, strict, I call them singleton strict monotonicity because they all have a singleton requirement to make them more general axioms, although who cares? But I keep them in that form. Uh, if you're a set, which is a superset, or the same set as a set B, then if A and B are not the same sets, then A, the superset, is strictly more freedom has strictly more freedom than B. That's the first assumption. It's a strict monotonicity with the additional proviso that A is singleton and B has two elements. To make it more restrictive, so therefore it is more general an axiom. You might expect a lot more things satisfying this. Secondly, singleton anonymity. Cardinality or number of elements in A equal to the number of element in B. I'm using hash here. Sorry about that. I'm changing my notation. Implies that 
A is the same freedom as B, but only for singleton sets. So any set with the same number, then you have no freedom at all, right? So if you have no freedom, then we're going to say every option, when you have only one functioning there, I'm sorry, it's the same level of freedom. OK. So that's what this axiom says. Second, thirdly, it's S independence, which says A is more free, or at least as free as B, if and only if, when you add in a bunch of other potential functionings or options, it retains the same relative ranking. And more than that, if you start with a set, you also get this ranking. So this ranking implies that one, and this one implies this one, whether you take out the same options or put them in. The taking out seems rather odd, doesn't it? Because one of those options you take out could be covering some of the other options in terms of quality. So it's a really anti-quality type of assumption. And this says that C doesn't have anything in common with A or with B in questionable notation. OK, that's a result. The result says these three axioms, that seems strange. So what would be the one that's really getting it? I would bet the anonymity. Let's double check. I'm going to drop some singleton restrictions. And if I do that, then it becomes really obvious because S anonymity becomes you're almost counting anyway already by anonymity that's not singleton. So it turns out that the set of axioms without the S before them is equivalent to the set with, and therefore it's a proof. It's almost that quick to prove this result. RC is horribly extreme. Which one's the weird assumption that gets it to you? And I'm s assuming it's anonymity. Let's double check. So what I'd do, if you didn't have the question marks, I'd be a lot happier. Uh, monotonicity. Let's relax to get singleton to just regular monotonicity and get rid of the strict part of it. Okay. A is, and this is the actual monotonicity assumption. If A contains B or it can be the same there as well, then A has more freedom or no less freedom than B. Hmm, I wonder what happens then. What you get in addition when you change that one axiom to get rid of the strict part of the monotonicity is there's only one more ranking. It's the trivial ranking that says everything's the same in terms of freedom. So that is a reasonable axiom. The strict part of it before was kind of weird. This makes sense. You know, if you had some really great options and you throw in something that's really crappy or even horrible, why would you imagine that to augment freedom? OK. This is consistent with that notion of freedom interpreted with, through the lens of quality as well. OK, next. Suppose that we get rid of the objectionable part that says get rid when you take out options, you preserve the freedom ranking. Get rid of that and only go the other way. If you add them, you can't disrupt it. Call that semi-independence. And you have the same conditions in terms of question marks on the uh, bottom side. What do you have that is, uh, what more do we have? Well, what we have is a kind of cardinality ranking of the following type. It's a kind of top-coded, a, a uh, uh, censored ranking, which goes like this. You have some k, and up until you hit k, you keep counting the options, and at that k, you just stop. Anything extra, you don't care. It's all k. OK? That is what you get, which includes trivial, because there the k is very small. You start at 1, and everything above 1 is the same with 1. And the actual cardinality is where you take it all the way up to the top, and you still count every single step along the way. So it turns out that S anonymity is really the key problem here, because it's ignoring the quality of the options. That's the inter interpretation. So based on this, we might impose, bless you, some underlying notion of individual preference and be sensitive to it. Could there be underlying preferences that are the basis of our freedom ranking or consistent with it? So how could we change the view of freedom taking account preference? Define the indirect utility ranking as follows. A has at least as much indirect uh, utility freedom uh, as B, if and only if x, the little x, is as good as little y for any 
best element of A and best element of B. So you take, compare best elements, and that's how you choose everything. So all you're paying attention to is the best element. Who cares about sets? This is very traditional, and this is also studied by these folks. It's a complete ordering, satisfying monotonicity, though not strict. Semi-independence, not independence, so it's consistent with those two axioms I changed. But not singleton anonymity, of course not. Because the options are better, they'll be giving more effective freedom to people through their quality. Result is that if you throw in another consistency axiom, you get this. And that consistency axiom is very similar to what Krebs had assumed in some results previously. And it says that if A is, has as much freedom as B and C has as much freedom as D, then you union them up and you still preserve the ranking in this order. You don't go back, you go this way. This cares only about the quality of the best alternative, not the quality or even quantity of other alternatives in the set. No value for unchosen alternatives. So the first ranking was weird, but it had value for unchosen alternatives, if you will. <laughs> this has no value for anything that wouldn't be chosen. And so how do you make sense of it? Well, you can always combine the two, and that's what some people have written, probably 20 papers written like that. Instead, a different approach, and it's plural preference approach. Uh, suppose the agent has a collection of potential preferences. Now, this could be the potential preferences that might be collectively agreed upon. It could be the fact that I could be a veg preference person one day and a non-veg preference person another day. It could be that I simply don't know and I wake up the day and it happens. Or it may be that I choose on the basis of something else, my preferences. All of those are consistent with the notion of thinking about a set of preferences that I have inherent in me that might be relevant for my situation. The timeline is that you're going to select the set, Z, right? The, right. You're going to select this, the set, not, not the entire. This Z wasn't the set, right? It was A. You're going to select an, select an A. Z is the entire thing. Select an A. Preference will be revealed to you. Up till then, you didn't know your preferences. So you have to select in ignorance of which one of these preferences is going to come up. And then you get to select the best element from the set and get whatever you get out of that. So that's the idea of it. You're judging on the basis of an eventual ability to get the best element from the set through perfect agency. The only thing that you don't have agency over is that you don't know who the hell you are. And you have to make the choice before you know who the hell you are. That's what this ordering is about. How does this alter the view of freedom? Freedom is flexibility is what the idea is here. So bear that in mind. You want to have good outcomes in lots of contingent situations. Krebs actually had the potential of changing production functions instead of preferences, but this is a simple way of doing it as well. Yes, go ahead. There are many, many situations where you have to make choices before you have a firm idea of things. The things here are preferences. And so that's, now, Sen does it the other way. Well, he, he actually does it even in his, in his uh, arrow lectures. The timing is um, you select X from, a, from, from the set, the A, first. Then preferences are revealed. And you're stuck with whatever you got. And so it's a lot more restrictive. And he gets a different ranking, which is much less complete. This one is more complete because at least you get a sense. Ah, select the set. You know who you are before you choose the option. But yeah, it's, you could think of all possible options of, of ordering of things. And this one's quite interesting and quite natural in a lot of circumstances that Krebs made apparent in his, in his econometric paper. Uh, not. I do not. No, yeah. 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 Yes. 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 That's. 
No, this, this in fact was formulated you know, way before, I mean, this is right after Sen's paper on plural utilities in like the 70s or 80s, and, and I came along with this idea of how to put this together in the early 90s. And then uh, you know, in, in economics, I started seeing multiple selves models coming along a while back. But I'd be, I'd be really interested in exploring these, these directions with someone. I haven't done it. And a dynamic model over time, in fact, part of the empirical exercise is perhaps this, where people are exp giving you more information on the, the frontier by their different preferences that they have over time and space. It's, I mean, it's very natural to, to use it for that purpose, but I, don't, I haven't, haven't gone to the next level. Uh, can I just ask you? Yes, you can. Yes, it is. It's perfect. Listen to that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. In, can you, I mean, you know this. They're investing and they're doing all these choices before they know at all what the kids are going to be wanting to do. They just want to make it so that they have the best life they can, to have the greatest freedom in some sense that they can have when it comes time for them to choose their own life for themselves. Very I'm natural. Indeed, you are. Instead of just giving them the choice. Yes. In anticipation of well, and, and but it is intentional as well. Maybe you have a problem that you have a, have an essence of, have intellectual probability distribution over the potential. Again, yeah. yes, and if you had any information on but that, you could incorporate it. But it's, I think that's a natural way of, of thinking about it. And intentionally, many parents do try to pull back from kids. They can't, but they do try in many different realms. I, I didn't tell my daughter that she needed to go to MIT, even though she was accepted, and chose Cornell. And I said, you're crazy. What the hell are you doing choosing Cornell? Go to MIT. But then I went like this and said, OK, it's good. It's a great place. I went there. It's very nice. And, uh, so, it's part of what we do as parents after a point. We just say, you know, we try our best not to encourage them to have certain types of preferences that should be under their own control. Other preferences, we mash them. <laughs> you got to be good. You got to do this. You have to have values. You better act this way. Right. So there's a mix of intentions by parents. OK. So here's the story. You got to rank the opportunity set before the specific RI is known. When RA is revealed, you get the best element. That's the idea. I could feel veggie or non-veg on a particular day or on a particular flight. Uh, and so <laughs> you uh, would like to have a place where you might be able to choose on a, the menu has both. Uh, that's the idea when I was uh, sitting with Prasanta Patnaik years ago and discussing this in the early 90s. It was, uh, that was the example we were thinking about because he's, uh, you know, veg. Uh, you were about yes, I was thinking about non-veg. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we, we both went to the same restaurant, and it was good. Good uh, Indian restaurant. Uh, Marx, remember, make it possible for me to do one thing today, another tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. How does this alter our view of freedom? Uh, well, here's what I have put in something called the effective freedom ranking. One opportunity set A is said to have as much effective freedom as the second one, and it's written with a little star in the R to denote the effective uh, freedom ranking. If a has as much indirect utility freedom as B for all allowable preferences. It's that simple. It's an intersection, but an intersection of the extended preferences over sets. And that's the subtle point. OK, so extend each one to the indirect utility ranking. Right? So you're judging each set by the best element on that preference. And judge accordingly. And do so for another one. Do so for another, do for the other, do for the, all of them. And where they all agree, you certainly are in good shape to say you have unambiguously more freedom than you would have. Uh, so when do you get more freedom? It turns out if you have an option which is dominating what was previously best for at least one preference, then you get more freedom on a strict level. When don't you get any more freedom? Well, if you have an option which is not anywhere near the top for anything, for any of the preferences, then throwing that option in does nothing. OK? So that's the intuition. 
A is as good as B no matter which R I obtain. Strict if one is strict. Note, this is a quasi-ordering. It's an intersection of complete orderings. Therefore, we know it's a uh, quasi-ordering. It's incomplete when people disagree. Kreps and Arrow actually go to the next step as we're talking about probability. Suppose you have pro subjective probability and you just do an expected utility analysis and it would be easy. The problem is that where does the probability come from? What utility function and so on. So we go back one step to get the kind of unanimity or unambiguous ranking. That's what this is all about. I'm going to do two more examples and that's it. First example is pretty obvious. And this is Sen's example from the Arrow Lectures. It's great, terrific, wonderful, bad, awful, uh, dismal. And uh, these are the two sets, A and B. And no doubt, RC, the counting one, is totally indifferent between those two. And that was his example to show how stupid that is. And <laughs> indeed, if you look at this one as well, it's uh, unambiguously strictly better by the, uh, and you know, obviously so, by the effective freedom ranking. This one's obvious. There's notorious agreement by everyone. All the RIs you know, implicitly are saying anything up on the top is better than anything on the bottom. If that's the case, Life is easy. But take a look at this case, and I'm just uh, kind of putting it in a two-dimension space. It's easier to explain that way. We have two entries, uh, quantity x1, x2. And the first preference relation on this space of points is saying one is good and two is bad. So x1 minus x2 is how good we feel in this example. So it's represented by that utility function. And of course, the other is entirely the opposite. It's the negative of that utility. OK, so you could be someone who wakes up on the side of the, and you just love this and hate this. And, or you could be the person you love this and hate this, the opposite. You would expect absolutely no agreement here, right? It's hopeless, certainly if you do what Sen does, where he doesn't know anything. So then there's no way or basis of ever deciding what one set has in terms of freedom than the other, because you have no idea what your preference is going to be. You're dead. But in this case, you have enough leeway so that you can see that that first set, hmm, 1133, three, it gives me pretty crappy utility no matter what. And the second one, because of the variance in the two, gives me a good situation no matter what. And so the second set is unambiguously more free than the first set because of the combination of, of course, numbers that you have to have options to go along with the preferences in this case, but also because of the quality of the options and how they do well under, there's one that does well under one, one that does well on the other. You have a good option no matter what the situation arises. The intuition, that's it. So measuring freedom is not necessarily as you know, obvious as you might think. It's tough. It's hard. It's not that bad as you might think, because cases like this do arise. And this is a pretty reasonably complete ranking if you have uh, for a number of examples. It's not that complete otherwise, and you have to go to the extreme case like what Arrow did in his uh, comment on my paper. All right. Well, we've done this. So what are we going to do next? Let's do a few applications. So please switch to the next one, and we'll do a, you see how far I get in applications? I think I have, what, a half hour or something? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Touch screen. Where do I have that other one? I'm not a. Jim loaded? Who loaded it for us? Oh, OK, good. That was the old one. So now we're back to the old one. We need the second one, which is uh, the, new, the second part of the presentation. I apologize. Should have mentioned that. There we are. Yes, it's the Handbook of Social Choice and Welfare, uh, 2010. Yes. Yes. 
Social Choice and Welfare, edited by Sen, Suzumura, uh, and Patnaik. And that's what year? Uh, 2010. All right, applications. Let's see if we can get a couple of good ones in before I have to run. Let's start off with poverty, yes. Uh, I'll just run to it quickly because otherwise I'm not gonna have time to do anything. Uh, a lot of people have said in the past that uh, the capability approach isn't particularly useful for bringing to data. And I think it is more or less still true on the whole. Uh, as we move forward, we start seeing signs of light. Uh, Since we have such little data on capabilities, we try to go to functionings. If you, even if you go to functionings, it's still tough because you have to think, well, if you read in that section in the book uh, on, e on economic inequality, the last section of the appendix, it goes through all the things that you have to do to create some sort of semblance of an indicator for inequality or poverty or so forth, including dealing with what dimensions and what indicators to represent each dimension, values or weights. and weights in the case where all the indicators are cardinal and meaningfully comparable to one another. Otherwise, who knows? What can you do if everything is ordinal or categorical with no natural metric for comparison? Creates all kinds of problems to aggregate when aggregation is really tough. It's really hard for me to see a solution for measuring welfare inequality and functioning vector space. It just I still don't know how to do multidimensional inequality at all. It's, it's tough. Um, when you have ordinal data, it's a million times tougher. So I'm, I'm just not there yet. So I've studied lots of other things, but that's one thing I haven't studied and look forward to doing so. If there's one indicator, yeah, okay, I can do it. I have a paper, Journal Health Economics, which is a median-based approach. And this, way is, this approach is up and coming. Uh, Tony Atkinson has a paper. Uh, which is at a particular journal right now, uh, talking about the median. And uh, it's really, really an interesting paper, no doubt about it. Uh, expanding a little bit on what we're going to talk about here and the polarization measure that I did that was what led to this Journal of Health Economics paper. Um, inequality rises with median preserving spreads. Tony talks about median preserving spreads and the spreads have to be mean preserving as well. But you can think about it even without, in a context where you can't deal with mean preserving because it's not cardinal, it's all ordinal, then this is the more natural way of proceeding for this environment. First order dominance, the way we get it in this paper is first order dominance one way, first order dominance the other way means more inequality. So median is here, you push it down in one direction and down in the other direction in terms of dominance, and it's a spread away from the middle, that's what our ranking winds up being, and we have a measure for that as well. Uh, we're, we're actually, there was a student here last year, Martina Kobus, who was sitting right over there in the other room, and uh, she uh, thought it would be interesting to work on a survey of this area. She has written a really neat paper in the area, and there's a lot of stuff coming on on ordinal measurement, uh, ordinal variables, and the measurement of inequality. Now, in this, you know, in our book, we offered some general guidance for creating a poverty measure using the capability approach, and the idea is like this. Poverty is seen as a capability deprivation or a functioning deprivation, something of that type. Uh, not just lowness of income, okay? So what does it mean to be a deprivation? You have to establish deprived. What does it mean to be deprived or not deprived? So you have to have cutoffs in each dimension of interest or in each variable of interest. And then you have to think about normative weights across dimensions. And I, I once again stress what, what Sen would say, although we've tried all approaches to weighting or valuing. Not data-driven, but resulting from a deliberative process is what Sen would say. Uh, and when you start saying, okay, how is that gonna be implemented in the real world? It is implemented right now in committees that assemble to determine these issues in poverty context. Uh, it's happened in Colombia, it's happened in Mexico, it's happening in El Salvador. In most countries in Latin America, there's discussions at various levels of working on this stuff. And it's now spread out uh, last uh, 
two, three, three weeks ago, we were in Oxford. Uh, President Santos from Colombia was right across the way from me, and next to me was the um, Vice Minister for Poverty in China. Very excited about this approach. Uh, so what I'm explaining to you has some salience in the real world. It's not just sort of, th you know, throw it out like that. Uh, normative values, uh, an independent poverty committee can do this. There are lots of other ways of informing such a committee. And then robustness tests to make sure you didn't do it too stupidly. Make sure the results seem to work even if you change things around. So we follow the structure of capabilities. We motivate, we're motivated by it. This is now used to measure global poverty uh, for the UNDP, for empowerment, for service delivery, gross national happiness. The index is built on the same structure, uh, the one in Bhutan. And uh, we, of course, are emphasizing the link with the capability approach. Uh, there's actually many, many, many moving parts. So that's an advantage and a disadvantage. It's flexible, but a lot of stuff has to be decided upon. On the other hand, once you've decided on it, anyone can replicate the result because it's all before you. It isn't like, you know, try and replicate PPP stuff. You have to have all the data. You can't even check robustness of everything. It's too hard. So here, all the parameters are set before you of everything right in front, okay? So sources are these two papers, one in Journal of Public Economics 2011, and I don't know if that's 2011 or 2012 in 2010. Uh, Journal of uh, Economic Inequality. So why in the heck would we want to be doing multidimensional poverty? Uh, is it just low income? No. Uh, you're interested in getting other dimensions that are relevant to people's lives. So why not put it directly into the de definition of who is poor and how poor they are? Capability approach provides a nice framework for describing this, and we use it extensively. There's more data sources. There's more tools based on unidimensional measurement of poverty. And there's all kinds of demand from governments, all kinds of demand. So here's the hypothetical challenge that was put before us, and indeed I'll put before you. A government wants to do something like this. The government would like for it to be understandable, a multidimensional poverty measure that could be easy to describe to people in the constituency, conform to some common sense notion of poverty, fit some purpose. And I usually see the purpose explicitly stated by these committees as being to evaluate, could be to target, it could be to coordinate. And Colombia now, it's, it's all based, uh, it's what they use to co uh, coordinate policy po uh, for poverty. It must be technically solid and operationally viable, which I assume all of that means, uh, the first one, technically solid, means it's published. Uh, operationally viable means that with the data at hand, we can actually implement it, and it could be implemented again, otherwise it's pretty worthless. Uh, what would you advise? These are the desiderata. Think about it. It seems almost impossible to think about it. I find it hard. I said when Sabina Alkire approached me on this project, I said there's no way on earth you can measure multidimensional poverty. I think it won't work. And she convinced me otherwise. It isn't so hypothetical. In fact, Mexico passed a law in 2006 that required them to include six dimensions beyond income in the measurement of poverty. That's what started everything going. 2007, we wrote this paper. 2009, Mexico announced their methodology, which is based on our approach. Bhutan as well, the Gross National Happiness Index. Uh, Chile had a conference, was an early leader in this area, then fell back only recently with the great failure of the poverty discussion in Chile and the uh, interesting results that led to the uh, retirement of a number of people. Uh, they're now con contemplating the idea of multidimensional poverty once again whole hog. Um, Colombia had a conference and then created their official statistic based on this approach, and there have been tons of workshops that we've been having, and right now I have a, about 60 people from government and PhD students actually back at my university at GW, which I'm teaching about this stuff. And uh, World Bank has had more conferences on this than I can I care to, to say. They just had a presentation yesterday from Sabina uh, in, in the World Bank. Okay, yes, question? Becky Blank, I had uh, lunch with her. She was the, she is, I guess, still Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Thank you for that update. <laughs> and did she get out of town already? 
So I missed her. She was 15 minutes from my office. I kept saying, give me a talk, give me a talk, give me a talk. Oh, crud. Okay, I'll have to pay the airfare one day. Brilliant. Uh, anyway. Okay. Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, that's true. So Becky informed me after a nice lunch at the Commerce Department that um, the silo effect in the U.S. is so bloody strong, there is no way in hell you're going to put into effect a multidimensional poverty measure. And she has been supporting the use of multidimensional poverty measures for a while. So I don't know if that's changed. We have enough examples now to point out that it can be done. That's the update. Mm -hmm. Um, I had thought that uh, Obama or one of his uh, folks would, would take it up pretty quickly because it's so obvious. You can really target stuff that you think is important. Yeah. Uh, there is. I mean, there will be. Yeah, I mean, it's a big political issue. It's wonderful and a great way of discussing things in the context of this. Colombia, I'll give you an example of, well, I'll give you Mexico example. Mexican governors hated their multidimensional poverty index initially. So this is horrible. I, I understood the income, what's going on here. And then the crisis occurred. They have other dimensions that are policy relevant that they're actually making progress on. Income, however, is socked like crazy during this time. Not like really crazy, but enough. And so through the multidimensional framework, they could point out how income here, because they include income in their measure, and all the other service and rights dimensions Improvements. We're doing our job. We're trying our best in this realm, but it's that neighbor up north. So it actually helped them deal with a crisis that in previous years, had they been focused entirely on income, it would have been problematic. More than that, and here's what uh, Carla Huff told me when I was sitting at a, uh, a lunch. I think it was a Nobel lunch at one of the AEA meetings. She happened to sit there, and we started talking. She said, what are you doing? I said, ah, oh, it's multidimensional poverty stuff. She said, explain it to me. So I did. She said, ah. I know what that's going to do. I said, look, these dimensions will probably be observable far before income could be seen. Effects on income would be seen. So governments are going to like this because it will have a more immediate impact and allow them to say they're doing something about poverty, and they are accurately doing it about poverty, in a shorter time frame, whereas income will be a longer time frame. I said, holy cow, that's brilliant, and I've incorporated it in all of my stuff ever since. Thank you, Carla. So it's good to learn. So there is a political element here, and I'll show you a coordination example in just a second uh, at the end of this part, this discussion. Yes, please. I have a question about the full-time cabinet. Yes, please. That's the question they could ask as well. I mean, it's the full-time They had a whole day on the UN about it. Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, how can we reconcile our thought experiment that we were supposed to go to Bhutan and we showed them, okay, here's a US passport. I think it's initiated by Well, what was interesting was that the people who created it in Bhutan were Bhutanese. They were from Bhutan. They weren't. Sabina was there because she spends time, spends time with the monks. She's a priest, and so my co-author. So she hangs out with the monks and is contemplative, and uh, decided that you know, okay, talk to people, and they were interested in something, and one thing led to the other, and all of a sudden, you know the. The king said this should be done. So she was there to offer a method that would work, but not the unique method, and then helped implement it. But it was all the values coming directly from the folks. I, I guess, I mean, can we use that to, to okay, suppose if every country we try to measure that compare? One could. Gonna are you going to compare across countries? Why are you interested across countries? I mean, are you? Then look at something that's across countries, which may be very different than the one you would want for your own country for your own purposes. So there's this interesting level, you know, multi-level discussion that's going on with MDGs as well. With the, the new post-2015 discussion is all in terms of multi-level. Where do you stop? The World Bank, for instance, in its, its measure of, social pro its measure of uh, economic progress, this crazy measure that Koshik uh, put together, I think it's interesting. Uh, lower 40%, you know, mean, and how much growth is going on in that mean as opposed to the regular mean. Uh, uh, what was I saying? I gotta, just forgot what I was saying. I mean, Yes, so the same thing occurred there was that they focus only on countries. They're not going to the global level at all. They're not going to aggregate, which is a good thing because it doesn't aggregate. 
because the person who's in the lowest 40% in one country may not be the lowest 40% worldwide, and lowest 40% worldwide may not be in a country. So you can't aggregate very easily the, the index. But this is an issue that's generic. Countries want a say in what they're going to be using for their own evaluation. And yet, you know, multilateral agencies want to have something going across so they can do the compare. Both can occur, just so long as it's a, it's a similar methodology that can be co compared and you know why it's changing because this variable is here but not here. This cutoff is here but not there. So it can be done. You can still vary the kind of gross national happiness index and compare it somewhere else based on what those variables are, but you, sometimes you'll get no intersection, so you won't make any sense of it, but it can happen. Yeah? Sorry, I, I was picking up what you said. Please? Um, the world is becoming, I was moving back. Yeah, except in my backyard, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> <where? laughs> we still think we're the center of the world, I think, in D.C. You know, who cares about anybody else? Yeah, yeah. anyway, but you're right, it is highly globalized. I know they do. Yep. Like yeah. And I'm also looking at in a world that is becoming increasingly materialistic. Yes. In the sense that a lot of people have developed a philosophy that money answered all. Mm -hmm. you know. Which goes right against what Sen has been saying all along. Exactly. So, yeah. So and that's why this poverty approach may be, in fact, more salient. Money doesn't a a answer everything. It's outcomes of various types that are of relevance to people. Yeah. So income is, is part of the mix potentially, but it's depending on the country itself. Maybe the country doesn't want income. Colombia didn't put income in their multidimensional poverty index. They put in something else. It's up to the people. You get to decide. Kind of weird, huh? Yeah. It's, uh, anyway, let me continue. I'll, I'll run off. I don't think I'm going to get very far on this. What timing do we have? Uh, oh, <clears throat> I'm doing okay. Okay, so let me just quickly review unidimensional poverty because it has some relevance to what we're talking about here. Some people don't know much about that, so I'll just mention a quick snapshot of 1976. Sen had this wonderful paper in Econometrica talking about poverty, identification was what people were concerned with before. Who is poor? It's not the identification you're used to. It's who is poor. And then the aggregation part is how much poverty is there, and he focused on that. Because he was a social choice guy, it made sense, aggregation, and that can matter, and it does matter. If you measure gaps as opposed to head count, as opposed to something sensitive to the distribution of income, it can be quite different. Uh, so he s created a framework and said, here's the goal, to find some poverty measure or some methodology. He used income or consumption as the variable. Identification was done with a poverty line, and aggregation was with some measure. Typically, in recent time, it's been aggregated with uh, Foster Greer Thorbeck measure. I just saw Hugo Suddenshine, who was the editor on this paper. You guys are graduate students, you'll, get, you'll appreciate this. Um, I was a graduate student at the time writing this thing, uh, 1979, you know, 1981. Oh, cool, let's submit this. So we submitted it and got back. Uh, we're not just going to publish another poverty measure paper. Uh, don't, not very sure that you have much chance. Uh, I give it less than 50% that you get accepted. This is from the editor of Econometrica. So I said, okay, I guess I could publish it somewhere else, but I don't want to, so I'm going to do what they say and submit it back. And it was published. And so I just ran into Hugo and said, you know, Hugo, that paper that you accepted years ago has now got, I don't know, eight, nine hundred Thompson types social sciences citations and four or five thousand Google citations. So thank you very much. And he said, it must have been good. <laughs> and I said, thank you very much. Yeah, so it's, you don't know what's going to work out or what's going to be taken up by people. That one was. So as you write your papers, just don't care what people say. Screw them. If it's good for you, you do it. And you put your heart in it. You get good advice from your faculty. Okay, and they'll tell you some stuff, and they'll beat you up and all this stuff. They'll ask questions in particular. But follow through, revise it, send it in, come hell or high water. George Akerlof sent things a hundred times to journals, finally got it published in their fabulous papers, and for some reason the people never realized it along the way. Uh, so be like that, be persistent. Okay, anyway. 
All right, so review. Come to me, please. Review. Thank you. You're slow. <sighs> Incomes. I'm just going to do this for income for a second and then generalize it. So 7, 3, 4, 8. Poverty line 5. Who's poor? The ones with the ones. The others are not. They're given zeros. OK, that's straightforward. Headcount ratio is the mean of that vector. The vector is called the deprivation vector. OK? Maybe that's not a good measure because it doesn't do anything about gap. So let's look at normalized gaps, which is the cutoff minus the achievement over the cutoff. For the second person, it's 2 out of 5, right? 2 over 5. Do it for all people, people who are non-poor, who cares? They get 0. That's the normalized gap vector. Take its mean. It's the poverty gap measure, which is used very, very frequently in analyses. And then finally, if you square that, why do you want to square it? Because look at the ratio here, 2 to 1 versus 4 to 1. You're really emphasizing the poorest of the poor, in the second case, more than the first one. Okay. Take the mean of that, and that's this FGT squared gap measure. These are, this is the class of measures we'll talk about. It's decomposable across uh, population groups. The World Bank uses this all over the place. And uh, it is a mean of something. I've got to tell you, if it's a mean of something, it's easy to use. Policy implications are explored by Bourguignon and Fields, which talked about the fact that if you look at the last measure, you actually focus on the poorest of the poor as opposed to the headcount, which emphasizes the richest of the poor. All right, so now let's start with a matrix of achievements. Here it is. These achievements are, you can see vaguely, domains floating up there. It turned white somehow. It doesn't matter. Domains are like this, people are like this. The domain, the first one might be something like income, dollars. I'm just using this as an example. I'm not using it as an example of capability, but example, incomes in dollars a day, uh, years of education, self-reported health from one to five, one being poor and five being excellent, and this is access to social services. So this is a matrix you might see of you know, scale data that's put before you. Uh, is it cardinal? Probably not. Maybe income is, maybe not, who knows. But anyway, it's given to us. Here are cutoffs. The cutoffs tell you who is deprived in that dimension. $13 a day in this US type data would be about right, maybe a little low. Uh, 12 years of education, anyone in this room knows 12 years is the cutoff for many good things happening and many bad things happening, okay, in terms of health, in terms of outcomes in labor markets and so forth. Finally, uh, self-reported health, below three, that means fair or poor, means you're deprived. Okay, that's what this would say. And finally, below one means you don't get the social service, say insurance or something else. That's the idea of the setup of the multidimensional approach. These entries fall below, as you can tell. The ones that have lines on them are below the respective Zs. And here is the setup. Hmm, deprivation matrix could be just the same as a deprivation vector. Let's put ones where you're deprived, zero if not. There you go. There's a nice matrix. Let's start with that one. Secondly, if we want to know something about deprivations and the depth of the deprivations, we could use a different matrix. Let's use this one, which is the normalized gap matrix. And it would say, respect to its own poverty cutoff, if you will, or deprivation cutoff, how far below was it in that dimension as a share of that cutoff. And of course, this is what the numbers would be for all the people. Some are more deprived, some are less deprived. And we could square it if we were interested in really emphasizing the situation of the poor is poor. OK, so identification. How do we do it? In this environment, identification is done very simply. Now, I'm assuming these are three equally weighted dimensions right now. It makes it easier to explain it to you. Otherwise, I have to put in four more bits of data I'm not going to. OK, so how do we identify who's poor in this world? The first person looks like that person is not poor. Not deprived in anything. The third person looks pretty sure as being poor. Deprived in everything. It's the other two we're concerned about figuring out who is poor and who is not. So let's count the number of deprivations put there called a C. Okay. Who is poor is the question of identification of the poor. You're poor if you're deprived in any dimension. How about that? That might be a way of thinking about it. It's called the union-based approach. And these are the poor folks. But there are problems with that. A single deprivation could be due to something else, and there could be all sorts of data issues that screw up the approach. And anyway, it yields incredibly high poverty numbers. I can tell you that by working on the committee in Mexico where we were getting 80s and 90s for Mexico with an approach that was proposed by a sociologist, and it just didn't pass what I call the smell test. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep? Do you want to worry at all about um, Yes, we do. 
we would love to worry about that. As of right now, I'm going to totally ignore that and assume that substitutability doesn't hold and complementarity doesn't hold. And it's just neutral, and I'm going to evaluate it as simple as I can. The complementarity is reflected in the way that we'll see I identify by looking at bunches of multiple deprivations at once, but that's as much as far as it gets in sensitivity to complementarity. Okay. Uh, yeah, you might be worried about that. Lots of people are. I've used self-reported health data before. It's, it's, you know, over groups it works pretty well. For individuals it can be a little bit more dicey, but this is individual approach. And I'm just doing it to illustrate it anyway, so I won't worry about it that much. We never, you know, we published these to, in the paper as an example, but we didn't do it anywhere further. Okay. But self-reported is it's just a really helpful indicator when nothing else is out there. Okay. We could do it in an intersection approach as well, which would say, you know, C equals 1. <laughs> and if you're poor in, uh, sorry, C is equal to all four dimensions. And you're, if you're poor in uh, all four, then you're considered to be deprived in all four. You're considered to be poor. And it would yield us out one person. But that's very extreme as well. It's a demanding requirement, especially if the number of dimensions is huge. And again, it has a very slight percentage of people who are poor. Even in Indian data, we get like negligible numbers of people who are typically deprived in everything that would matter. Yes, if you want to, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah it would be a feedback effect, potentially. Yes, people do ha have worried about that. And that is one of the reasons why you may not want to use self-report for targeting purposes when everyone knows you're using it for targeting purposes. But it's only one of many dimensions. And figuring it out is actually quite tough because if everyone starts reporting falsely that they're really bad off in health, it just blunts the ability of the technology to prioritize. And by the way, if you have too many people who are considered poor, uh, governments have a way of adjusting budgets appropriately. They do. And we'll see the way that they tend to adjust it in this environment. They'll choose a K that's different. Here, now I have the K. K is a uh, cutoff. And let's suppose that we don't want to have one extreme, we don't want to have the other. Let's choose something in the middle. Okay, how about two? You know, because I, I simply don't know yet. I'm just going to try this out. What happens if you have two? Then look who's poor. It's those two folks, but the final one ain't. Okay. Here's all the examples, and uh, so I identified who's poor. It's a approach that is including union and intersection, but it's something intermediary. It isn't as extreme, it prioritizes who's poor. And it's useful in these extreme cases where we have numbers of dimensions being pretty large. Next step and final step is to aggregate. So let me tell you how that is done. First thing we do is we get rid of the data of the non-poor person, goodbye. You're still there, but you have zeros. Your deprivation is the deprivation of a non-poor person, not a poor person. The Ministry of Education should be aware of that deprivation, but the Ministry of Social Development, sorry. It's not that ministry's responsibility or discussion. Okay. It is something that could matter. So inequality in what way? Across people or across dimensions? Okay, so it could be different. Yes, it would matter. But in, as far as this evaluative process is concerned, in the top figure it would be the same number if it were one or the other. But what would happen is that when you, it's actually a methodology that has a top figure and bunches of decomposed bottom figures. The bottom figures have all that information in it. And it shows exactly where you should be addressing, how you should be addressing poverty. It's a so-called uh, headcount, censored headcount ratio, which says who or what percentage of the population is both poor and deprived in this dimension. That's the data that you decompose it to in each dimension, and you can then focus depending on dimensions. This measure has that property. So you can do this uh, uh, censoring for all the matrices, the deprivation, the gap, the squared gap. And let's see what aggregation procedure we might choose. The long traditional approach in multidimensional poverty is to use a headcount ratio. But 
headcount ratio has some problems. We'll talk about that. Two people out of the four are poor here. But look, let's suppose that one of the persons actually has more deprivations. Look at it, see? More deprivations. Okay. What happens to the headcount ratio? Of course it goes up, right? No, it stays the same. Consequently, we might say that it's not dimensionally monotonic. It doesn't increase when you have another dimension of deprivation for a poor person. So what can we do? Maybe we should augment information. Capability approach is all about augmenting information, and now we're augmenting information in a different sense, which is to take into account the so-called deprivation shares. So these two people have two out of four, four out of four, take the average. The average intensity or average deprivation share is three-fourths. Let's use that information. That information is used in a, product, a product, H times A, H being the percentage of people who are poor, A being the intensity or breadth. Multiply the two together. That's the measure M0, the adjusted headcount ratio, which is behind all these indices I'm talking about. Yes? No, I said at the beginning I'd keep them equal for the exercise. They're easily weighted, easily valued differently. And the four definition, so all zeros become four plus one zero, even if it's a very low No, no, it depends totally on weights as to who is identified as being poor. Yes. That would be endogenous to it. And would be prior would be the weights then, or the values. It's really not weights. It's the value of a deprivation. And you're adding up values of deprivations. That's how I view it. Uh, it becomes weights in a population. But even then, it's, it's just adding up the value of the deprivation. OK, so here's the measure. It's h times a. It's a half times 3 fourth in this case, which would be 3 eighths. But guess what? It's just the same as taking the mean of the censored matrix. Add up all the entries. There's six of them over 16, 3 eighths, same number. You're just taking a mean of a matrix. Very simple to calculate, and it's, we have tons and tons of people who are doing the calculations now. Here are the numbers attached to it. Uh, if person two had an additional deprivation, obviously A would go up, and the overall adjusted headcount ratio would increase. It satisfies that dimensional monotonicity. Yes, please. Yes? It increases the, the, the numerator by one, but then you increase the, there's, there's sort of a, a latent one that has under the, in the, in the fourth row. Uh, so if you added up, you know, in, the, in the bottom right-hand corner there, if you added the one, then that person would turn on. Yes, it would turn on. So this is the mean that increased by two. Who gets, that's right, it's, it's, a, it's small increments. It's a head count ratio, but it's got smaller increments. And this, in this case, you actually, by adding the deprivation to someone who already had one, it pops them up, in this case. And the one in the top row, it doesn't pop them up, naturally. But it is discontinuous. It has that property as all headcount-based indices have. Observations. Uses ordinal data. We didn't do one thing that paid attention to the numbers in those matrices except with respect to ord ordering. That is cool. Take any monotonic transformation of every cutoff and all the numbers in that column, and it will be the same identification as who's poor and the same number for M0. This is the crucial property that has led this measure to be used in the real world using qualitative data and capabilities. It's similar to the traditional poverty gap. It can be expressed as H times I. I is the average depth. H is the incidence. Well, here it's the average breadth incidence, so it's very similar, in fact, quite closely linked in a new paper on describing that linkage even more uh, in, uh, explicitly. It's decomposable across dimensions. This is, I mean, it's decomposable across people, but across dimension, after you know who's poor, you can tear apart to see where poverty is coming from among the poor. So it's quite useful. It isn't useful for perspective thinking, oh, there's a people who aren't poor with some deprivations here we have to look out for. That takes another type of analysis. But for the people who are poor, you can figure it out. There's the censored headcount ratio. It's the average censored headcount ratio across dimensions. And it can be characterized using notions of unfreedom. That theorem I just showed you, remember it had a censoring? That censoring becomes like a poverty line in K. So that theorem supports this approach to measuring. Um, what if data are cardinal? You can use the cardinal data to obtain 
very, very nice results in terms of uh, new approaches that are based on gaps or squared. I won't get into it because, frankly, I don't have time. Uh, an entire class of measures can be defined as the kind of adjusted FGT family based on the multidimensional approach. I'm not going to show you the illustration. I know you'd love to see it, but I won't do it. Instead, I just want to summarize the results as to what this gets us. It's a dual cutoff approach, deprivation cutoffs, poverty cutoff, decay is a poverty cutoff, aggregation is FGT, and it's poverty is multiple deprivations. You're identified as being poor when you are broadly enough deprived. That really makes sense. It's also dependent on the joint distribution, not on individual dimensions marginally considered. A person's achievements in all dimensions matter, and many people don't get this. Uh, Angus Deaton said we need to keep saying it again and again because people don't get it. Uh, ordinal data, it depends. You can use dirt floors versus covered floors. Qualitative data are being converted to quantitative zero one data and used. It's transparent once you have all the variables, deprivation cutoffs, etc. You can replicate it, and everyone can replicate it independently to make sure that it's appropriate or whether it's robust to changing any of these things. And it's already been implemented at tons of level, levels across country in the MPI, which appears in the Human Development Report, within country at Mexico, Bhutan, Colombia, et cetera. Village levels participatory for evaluation impacts on poverty, and as a coordination tool for, for Colombia, let me go directly to the Colombia example. It's a hell of a lot of fun because there's a neat picture, and then I better quit because I'll miss my boat. Uh, here's what Columbia came up with, and I want to just point out the two dimensions that they were most interested in. Uh, work, a vi very big issue in Columbia, and uh, housing conditions. These are the two big policy, re the others are policy relevant as, as well, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying these are the ones they were focusing on as being especially important, and sometimes you don't get work variables in these sorts of measures. So a construction of the measure had equal weights in dimensions, and then they had indicators within dimensions that each of them, the deprivations in each, was taken into account because they didn't feel they could aggregate across them in any effective way, even within dimensions. So each one then got a, a kind of value which is given below. There's the percentage, the value percentage uh, for each one of these indicators in the particular column. They use this in interesting ways, and I want to show you the way that they use it to coordinate poverty uh, policy in Colombia. That's the president leaning over to his ministers and saying, look, here's our target. We need to achieve this kind of outcome. You, minister in health, are responsible for this. You, minister in education, are responsible for this. You, and it's all around the table describing what's happening over time and space. They update data frequently and they meet to consult with uh, the president. The, co the poverty committee meets to talk about this. The, mi the ministerial committee meets to talk about this very frequently. And when I saw this, I said, this is really a fascinating application. I hadn't thought of it before. They're using the multidimensional measure as a coordination device so that we can see what each of us is doing to achieve a commonly held end. Fascinating. That's where I'm going to end up. Music